This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. I am your host, Tate Frazier, and today we have the Ringer's very own Kevin Clark back. We're going to go through the biggest storylines in the NFL offseason, maybe even talk about a little Formula One. But again, Kevin Clark is back on the show. Let's get into it. All right, we are back with Slow News Day host Kevin Clark. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on the show. Again, it is the offseason in the NFL, so you know there's not too much going on. We got a lot of dominoes that are out there that are still yet to fall. We got, you know, conversations to be had leading into training camp and things like that. But in general, we're looking at futures and we're trying to forecast what's going on. So I have FanDuel. Thanks to FanDuel, I have the odds, the current Super Bowl odds sitting in front of me. The Kansas City Chiefs are the favorite at plus six hundred. The Eagles are the second favorite at plus 850 and I want to start there and ask you this que- this question Kevin because I've seen a lot of people talk about this and maybe it's the Philly propaganda in my life but have the Eagles won the offseason because if you talk to anyone mm. from Philly and outside Philly it seems like they're the de facto team that people point to and they say yeah Philadelphia won the offseason what do you think about that I always have trouble with the who won the offseason question because it's almost two parallel tracks Mm -hmm. which is who's going to be the best team in 2023 versus who actually improved themselves the most. Sometimes teams can add three wins to their total sort of incidentally because they got a couple of free agents or they hit on a couple of rookies, but that doesn't mean anything for the long-term plan. Like it's just so hard to quantify who's winning the off season. I I did this exercise last week in my podcast and the amount of, of, of people who had, for instance, the Browns last year, um, on their most improved list. It's it's unanimous. Um, the Chargers was to make some huge leap last year and they got they had a kind of a generation defining playoff loss in the first round. So it's always hard for me to say a team like the Eagles, who have high expectations already, won the offseason. Um, I do think that there's there's a bit of a a context around it, which is that the Eagles kind of won the offseason in the sense that no one from the NFC looks significantly better. Like the, the biggest threat to them is the Niners. And by the way, the Niners look like they might roll with, with Sam Darnold until Brock Purdy is healthy. Like if they went out and got a different quarterback, something like that, maybe the Eagles are in more danger. I'd love to be an NFC team right now. I just don't think there's a lot going on there. Um, and so when I think about teams who are winning the offseason, I think about teams that uh, made good value moves, and they have a core that's getting better. A team like the Detroit Lions, who have a bunch of young players who are probably just going to get better from one year to the next. The Seattle Seahawks, in a conference where there's not a lot of talent, have a great young core. I know Tariq Woolen is going to have surgery, but I think just generally, um, that's who I look at when I think about who's making a leap one year to the next. It's not necessarily, we always overrate the, the, the impact of first year draft classes. You always say, oh, you can throw in this, you know, this cornerback was drafted 23rd overall, whatever. It's usually going to take a year, especially when you're talking about offensive linemen or even defensive linemen in a lot of cases. Um, not everybody gets to be Micah Parsons. And so I think just generally, um, when I think about who wins the offseason, it's always going to be a team with the young core that's always getting better. I circle the Lions, I circle the Seahawks in that bucket. Um, I, I, I wouldn't rule out a team like the Dolphins, who got obviously a lot better last year. They get Jalen Ramsey this year. Um, there, there's just a couple of teams that I circle where I say, okay, I know this team's going to be better heading into 2023. 
Yeah, and you mentioned the Lions, and they will actually open the season Thursday, September 7th at Arrowhead Stadium. And I talked about the favorites to win the Super Bowl. Uh, the Chiefs are looking to become the first team to repeat as Super Bowl champs since the Pats did it in 4 5 Obviously, they beat the Eagles last year. They've won two Super Bowls in the last four years. But they also lost their offensive coordinator. Eric Bieniemy decides to go to Washington to be their offensive coordinator. Now Matt Nagy. Yes, that Matt Nagy will be the offensive coordinator for the Chiefs. Should we expect Pat Mahomes to you know, throw for 37 touchdowns and to kind of run it all back again? Should we expect that to be reality? Is there value in just go ahead and betting the Chiefs at this point? The Chiefs are probably going to win the Super Bowl every year <laughs> for, right. for the rest of our lives. That's how okay. it feels. They've still got Andy Reid. They've still got Patrick Mahomes. There's no other, there's no other team I feel is anywhere close to this. And I remember talking about this right after the Super Bowl win a couple months ago, where the only two teams in my lifetime where I considered the AFC championship game to be the floor, as long as there's not, not some health disaster and, and the coach is still there. Uh, it's the Patriots with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. And it's the, the Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes chiefs. That's it. And if they lose before the championship game and any year, it should be considered a failure. Uh, sorry to Giannis, but there is failure in sports and it can be that. <laughs> Um, so I, I just generally think that that there's there's not a lot AFC teams can do right now except get in the final four and pray. Um, a team like the Bengals, I, I really do think keeping that core together, especially with their wide receivers, is really important. I think this is going to be the last cheap year for Joe Burrow, or at least the last year until they have to start planning on fitting 50 Two fifty-three, fifty-four million dollars uh, into the salary cap for Joe Burrow. They're already selling the naming rights to the stadium to try to raise some money. That is not a joke. My joke has always been that they should actually just sell the naming rights to Joe Burrow's contract, so that anytime they mention Joe Burrow's contract, they get it gets quick and loans. By yeah, yeah, right. Skyline Chili, whatever. Yeah, yeah the quick and loans <laughs> Joe Burrow contract. I'd rather have that than the Bengal right. Stadium, right? <laughs> like Ford, you're telling me Ford doesn't want to buy in to the Joe Burrow contract? Come on. I like it. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, so I, I I just think there's a couple of teams there that can just get in and, and just, just hope something happens in the same way the Bengals did two years ago. Um, the Bills are certainly going to be in the mix. The fact that they still are stacking talent on the roster. I think when you see DeAndre Hopkins go somewhere, it's going to be one of these top teams. If, if it's the Chiefs, we can pretty much call it a day. Um, but, on, you know, on the other hand, this is a year-to-year league in a way I don't think we really appreciate. Um one of the things that I, I, I think I used, I always used to think was a cliche, but the older I get and the more I'm around football, the more I understand it, is coaches in August when you're at training camp will always say like, eh, you know, we don't have a, have a football team yet. And what I mean by that is like, you don't know what shape are guys in from one year to the next. Health is just can swing wildly depending on one hit in a career. All it takes is one defensive tackle to, to you know, to not work out that offseason. All of a sudden your run defense is gone. And so I think that penciling in certain probabilities over a long period of time is usually foolhardy. But having the best coach in football, which right now is Andy Reid, the best quarterback in football, Patrick Mahomes, a passable defense, which it seems like they'll have every year. Brett Beach is a very good general manager. I just I don't see a lot of hope if you're not the Chiefs right now. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, one of my favorite tropes in sports is when someone says it's a copycat league, but usually we copycat the champs. And uh, yeah. one of the trends that I saw with the Chiefs is they decided to remove all their fullbacks, so they have just added another <laughs> tight end. Yeah. Is this a new thing? Are, are the fullbacks officially, are they on life support, you know, Kevin? So, or are we worried about yeah. fullbacks right now? We, I've been worried about fullbacks for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been able to sleep. Um, but. So there's two things here. The fullback was dying a slow death. And I remember 20, 2008, 2009, 2010, um, there was a trend towards a couple of positions going away. One was the kind of bulky run stuffing middle linebacker um, who, you know, wasn't, we're not talking about Brian Urlacher here. We're talking about guys who just, their job was to knock people's heads off. That went mm -hmm. away. And in a lot of cases, the fullback went away. You saw a, once Kyle Shanahan started giving huge money to the fullback, we started seeing a couple of coaches say, okay, maybe there's something here running that system, understanding the fullback can be a thing, maybe making it more of a hybrid with an H-back. I understand that. Um, but I, I do think that the idea of having a fullback on the field can help you. 
But if you're Andy Reid and, and you just want to play that style, I understand why you wouldn't want to invest any money in that. So if you listen, you can you can train a tight end or even a defensive tackle to play fullback on three or four snaps per year. You don't have to waste a roster spot. I just think it depends on your offensive system. Um, if you need a, a blocker like that, if you can use him as a pass catcher out of the backfield, the Ravens are a good example of a team that have used that used used the fullback really well. Um, and I remember the the fullbacks were dying. It's such a, a, a fast clip a couple of years ago, Tate, that um, they had a little club. And I believe uh, I believe I saw it in the Ravens locker room that there was a hat that all fullbacks had that just said, make <laughs> make fullbacks great again. Um, nice. And so there's been a movement among fullbacks to, to come <laughs> back, but it's not going to happen in Kansas City. Yeah, it feels like something where it's like the five timers club with SNL, right? Where like yeah. they all get their own hats or jackets. They're like, I'm still a fullback. I'm still out here. I'm still doing this. We talked about the Chiefs, obviously defending champs, yada, yada, yada. They they continue to win. They've won, what, eight straight AFC West titles at this point, so they know what they're doing. Let's talk about the team they're playing the opening weekend. You said you'd love to be in the NFC. That's a good spot to be in football right now. One of the darlings of the offseason, the Detroit Lions, um, and you talked about our ages before. The Detroit Lions have not won a playoff game since I've been alive. The last time <laughs> that they won a playoff game was 1991, um, and right now they're the odds-on favorites to win the NFC. North. They won eight of their last 10 games last year. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of smoke around the Detroit Lions right now. Should we believe the hype, Kevin? Because last year after hard knocks, we all bought in. They kind of started out slow. Then they came on late in the season. Is it is it time for Detroit finally to get back in the playoffs and maybe even win a game for the first time? Yeah, I've spent a lot of time in Detroit, um, and it's interesting. The building plan is right on time, and I think the media accelerated it a little bit last year. Uh, I talked to their GM, Brad Holmes, last year in camp, and he said that the first year was really what he called the HVAC year, um, which was they were building a house, and they just really needed a basic structure to it, right? Um, and and so they they trade Matthew Stafford. They start getting some young guys in the, the building, seeing what they had, seeing what they didn't have. They did a, pretty much a full teardown. And last year was going to be the let's start adding extra pieces, and the third year is when you start competing for a division championship. That was that was lined out outlined pretty quickly uh, before last season. I think the media accelerated it. There were a ton of gamblers who were hot on. I know that uh, sounds like there were a ton of gamblers on the Lions, but also there were a ton of gamblers uh, who were actually betting on the Lions outside the facility um, who, who have not been suspended. And that sort of accelerated the timeline a little bit. I think that what they had last year was a proof of concept for something that um, that is real and sustainable. The league likes Jared Goff more than than the media does. The young talent is there. Dan Campbell is a really good coach. Ben Johnson, who stayed on as an offensive coordinator for another year, is a really good OC who could have basically had his pick of head coaching jobs and just wanted to stay on, stay on with the program. Um, and and you see, I talked to Ben Johnson a couple of years ago when he was tight ends coach, and he talked about that program and, and, and that building and that vibe. And he basically said that one of the things that keeps him going is that he just doesn't want to disappoint Dan Campbell. Like he just mm. loves Dan Campbell so much. And it, it almost comes off like Ted Dan Campbell is like a, a jacked Ted Lasso. Like when you hear those anecdotes where it's just like, all right, players just want to be around him and, and play for him and play hard. Um, and, and I've always gotten that sense that he's just a really authentic guy that people, people like being around. I, I've, I've never bought into the cartoon caricature aspect of it. I think sometimes he says some crazy stuff at press conferences and people kind of extrapolate it from that in the locker room. He's a guy who I think people enjoy his honesty and his authenticity. So, yes, I believe in the Lions, but I also believe in the Lions partly because the NFC is just weak. And I'm talking about the, the Eagles and whether or not they won the offseason. Like, we do have to remember the Eagles in the playoffs beat in the NFC basically beat bartenders and insurance brokers. I mean, that was <laughs> that was some rough stuff. And, and 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 they almost won the Super Bowl, which was their best. Like that was the best game they played. I felt like against the Chiefs, uh, they played a Giants team that I just don't think was was all that good. Which again, you were talking about accelerated timelines. I just think they were near one of a two or three year build. Um, they played a Niners team that just ran out of quarterbacks, um, and so they had an amazing season last year. But they also were in a conference where there just wasn't a lot there. And so I fully expect the Eagles to be the first or second best team in the NFC this year. 
Um, but I also expect a team like the Lions to be much better because there's just not a lot of talent in that conference. Aaron Rodgers in that conference last year. By the way, the Lions beat him. Um, but on the other hand, Aaron Rodgers is gone now. The Vikings mm. are not that good. They're in kind of a weird hybrid thing where they're trying to get long-term flexibility while keeping their core together. The Bears, not really sure if this is the year for them. So you look at that division and you just say, okay, this Lions thing makes sense. It's, I, I don't believe there are many miracles in football. Everything seems to make sense when you look at the talent and all that stuff over a long period of time. This Lions build makes sense, especially in that division. Yeah, and the Lions have the fourth best NFC uh, odds to win the Super Bowl. You got the Eagles, you got the Niners, you got the Cowboys, and then you got the Lions at plus twenty two hundred. So obviously, the gamblers out there, you know, have an affinity for Detroit. They believe in Detroit, and uh, the Danimal, uh, as I like to call him, I think he's, uh, you know, there, there's a reverence for him in that building. Uh, but you know, with the Detroit Lions players, obviously. Um, I got you. I was talking about gamblers. You mentioned gamblers. We have to talk about probably the most famous gambler in the NFL. That's Calvin Ridley. He is back. He is in Jacksonville. Um, and if you look at the headlines, they are trying. You know, there's some rust, obviously, but we know he's a, a talented player. They brought him into the building. Um, Trevor Lawrence show, showed some signs, right, that he can compete at a high level. I saw that. You know, they were putting the top five quarterbacks lists like in one of these, you know, talk shows, and Trevor Lawrence is quote tweeting it like eyes emoji. Geez, you know, like they, they're not respecting me, right? Respect my game, bro. Um, it feels like, you know, Doug Peterson has tapped into something there with Trevor Lawrence. What do we expect from Calvin Ridley, if anything? Is there going to be some sort of a redemption story here? Yes. Um, and I want to say a couple things. Number one is that I've seen a couple people, not a couple, a lot of people come out on Twitter and say, how could you suspend these guys? because everything's sponsored by gambling companies or whatever. And it's like, well, there's different rules for players and fans like that's and media. So like, that's not a good point. Please stop making it. Um, so <laughs> it sounds good though. It's provocative. Does it? That's what people does want. It? Yeah. <laughs> does it sound good? Um, so I think the world of Calvin Ridley, I think he's one of the best, most skilled route runners in football. I understand why there's a couple of reasons why the Falcons want to move on from just from a timetable perspective. Um, I don't, I think the Jaguars are further along. Calvin Ridley would probably rather play in Jacksonville um, with the quarterback and Trevor Lawrence, who's a lot better than, than Desmond Ritter. So I understand all of that. Um, I think just sort of big picture, I'm expecting huge things out of Jacksonville. Um, I just, first of all, every time Doug Peterson does literally anything, it confirms that, that Urban Meyer was the worst coach in the history of the NFL. Um, and just addition by subtraction. Like somebody was saying to me last night, actually, they were just like, they're talking about the Doug Pearson Eagles. And they were like, isn't it amazing how quickly he turned around Jacksonville? And it's like anybody would have turned around Jacksonville just a little bit by not being Urban Meyer. You, me, uh, trying to, you know, David Culley, all those Texans coaches, <laughs> Lovey Smith. They, Eric they the enemy, maybe Eric the enemy, yeah. Eric the enemy. It's truly, no, that's, that's, actually real though um that he would have that that been significantly better than urban meyer and yet they, they went out and got urban meyer um but i think that it's just this is the type of team that by the way if they were in the nfc would compete for for like conference championship level stuff um i think in the afc it's still a tough road to hell to go against i don't i don't even think the jaguars are in that upper echelon with the bills the Bengals, let alone the chiefs but i just expect some exciting football i expect a young roster that just knows what they're doing um i know we make fun of trent balke a lot but there really is some talent on that roster year two of um a, a pretty athletic draft class that's what what Trent Balky's known for length, athleticism, all of that stuff. So I'm expecting another leap. The fact that they won a playoff game and it felt normal. Um, it didn't feel like it was some sort of weird smoke and mirror season. That to me is the sign of a, of a team making progress, a franchise making progress. I've always felt like there are three types of owners, owners who want to win and know how to. So Robert Kraft is a good example. Um, Jeffrey Lurie in Philadelphia is a good example. They want to win. They want to spend the resources and they know how to go about it. Then there's owners who don't care about winning. And if they win every five years, congratulations, you know, they're happy about it, but you know, they're, they're not going to freak out when they go, when they, when they win seven games. And then there's a third group of owners. And I think that's the most interesting group of owners. It's the ownership that wants to win, but hasn't figured out how. And I think David Tepper in Carolina, uh, you, a team you might know well, I think <laughs> it's a good example there. And I think Shad Khan was in that bucket too. 
he desperately wanted to give patience to coaches who maybe didn't deserve it because he thought that was how you go about it. Um, but he just hired some of the wrong people on the front end. Gus Bradley was a bad hire. Mike Malarkey was a bad hire. Urban Meyer was the worst hire I've ever seen, even though I thought that if he brought some some more effort and innovation to the NFL, I think that could have worked. He just didn't have it anymore. He was done. He was like a player who, you know, he couldn't run anymore. It was over for him. Um, the Jaguars were always, I know this sounds crazy. You might laugh at me, Tate, but like Jaguars are always a sleeping giant because mm. I felt like once they figured it out, and I've heard from people from, from people in the league about this, that once they figured it out, they were going to be happy to devote resources to it, to have to have a, a system set up where you get a long runway for patience and all that stuff. And, and who knows how this develops? I'm just saying that Trevor Lawrence is in a better position than maybe people thought this time last year. Yeah, Doug Peterson goes 9-8 and eight in his first season. They knock off the Chargers, right? That was a big playoff win. And now they're plus 2,500 to win the Super Bowl, which is a, a lot better odds than most people would expect after the Urban Meyer experience. You mentioned the Panthers. One last football question before I ask you uh, about F1 quickly. The Panthers are <laughs> plus 6,000. Yeah, I, yeah, I like that transition. Uh, they're plus 6,000 to win the Super Bowl. Bryce Young is the number one pick. Um, is there a chance? Are you saying there's a chance, Kevin? Can, there's a chance can magic for happen? A for chance just for magic. What? For just just a magical run, like a Rudy Rudy S run, but in the NFL, Bryce Young is just catches fire. Uh, he leads them to an amazing twelve win season. Then they go. To, no, I'm kidding. None of this is going to happen. But no, will let me they tell at least happen? Will let they at least win happened, five Tate. games? Can no, they win five listen, games? Tate, listen, no. <laughs> so I've been thirsty this whole segment, and I was like, when am I going to be able to get my seltzer? And yeah. then as soon as you brought up the Panthers, I was like, well, this this question's going nowhere. This, this, I'm sip, just time. Just this sip time. This is sip time. This is sip time. <laughs> You're Kermit right now. Hits the spot. Yeah. Hits the spot. You're just laughing at me. Uh, are, are you excited right. to no. watch? Are you excited to watch Bryce Young at least? I mean, he feels like uh, he's the number yeah. one pick. They got a new head coach, but doesn't feel like he's getting the headlines like most number one picks. Um, I I think there's just a lot of doubts about him because of the size. I'm intrigued to see it because I don't know what this is going to look like. The I forget who said it, but maybe it was Daniel Jeremiah that basically what the Panthers were doing were banking on the evolution of the game right they were banking that that a, a smaller quarterback doesn't have to play like a smaller quarterback all the time um it can hang in the pocket and can use his mobility in the pocket but he doesn't have to be someone like kyler murray who is a small quarterback but plays a totally different way and kind of falls down every time there's pressure right um and has such fast feet that he can run a bounds whenever there, there's an issue very strong is not that so there are some legitimate durability questions um i love the the steph curry comparisons even though they frustrated me at times i thought that was funny um so i'm i I don't i've never had more intriguing questions about a prospect because there have been first overall picks i think just can't play and i'm not intrigued to see them because i think they're going to be bad bryce young can play bryce young is awesome it's more about the style of play he's going to play um what what how he stands up to NFL defenses I'm really I'm just fascinated by it and so yes to answer your question no this is no this is no seltzer zone for me um I am (laughs) actually intrigued to see what what Bryce Young does with this Panthers team whether it's you know Jeremy Fowler was just on my pod this morning who's saying that you know Brian Burns is still one of the most underrated players in the league you know yep the Rams offered him two first for two two first round picks last year. Like there's still talent on that team. And and one of the things I think is interesting, and I put Denver in this bucket too, where they've got star players on, on some sides of the ball and no one cares because they're just such a ghost ship. And this year, I feel like the Panthers can kind of rediscover themselves and figure out what they are because they'll at least be an NFL franchise. Yeah, it's a defense that has Burns, Derek Brown, J.C. Horn. Like, you have some name recognition on that defense. And then uh, also you have a situation where there was a video that came out, and I want you to debunk this or maybe help me deal with it, but there was a video that came out. Is it AI? No, it wasn't AI. I don't think so. Maybe it was. But the offensive linemen stand up before they get into their stance, and you cannot see Bryce Young. Like, you literally – That doesn't sound like AI. That does not it, sound like AI. That sounds like a problem. It concerned happened. me. It concerned me a little bit, Kevin. Then I went to the beat reporters that are covering, and they're like, it, it was a little, you know, it was a bad angle, bad lighting, whatever they wanted to say. But it did worry me a little bit. Uh, are are we worried a little bit about the size there? I mean, bad even angle? He, 
Yeah, it was bad. So like angle. when we're we're like at a bar and we take a photo and we look a little <laughs> yeah. rough and it's like, oh man. Yeah, yeah. Not That's my why side. you take it. Bryce Young hasn't <laughs> learned. You take the photo with your phone so that you can mm. control what photos get out there. Yeah. How has Bryce not learned this? You just say, everybody, hey, take this, take this one on my phone, take this one on my phone. And then you just put it out later on the gram and you look tall as hell. Right. And if I was a beat reporter, I would not have put that video out. So uh, I just want to say that for the good of the Panthers, don't put that video out. It does concern me a little bit, but I, I think Bryce Young will be okay. Because we just saw Monaco, we saw the Grand Prix this weekend. A little bit of rain, uh, a lot of tires being changed due to the rain. But at the end of the day, Red Bull and Max Verstappen they get another win, uh, remain dominant. What did you see um, in this race, if anything? What is the big storyline coming out of it? Again, I'm bird's eye view. I watched it as it was happening live. But what was the big talking point, and why were you not in Monaco? That was my biggest gripe when I when I saw Monaco. I'm like, Kevin Clark should be there, shaking hands, kissing babies. Uh, I had a child. Okay, so you're I, kissing I your own baby. I okay, was kissing my it. own baby. I was yeah, tending right. my family. Checks out. I, I, I presumably could go. I just didn't. I've never asked anybody. I, I think you should. Maybe that's <laughs> the maybe that's the point of this. You should ask. They asked if I wanted to go to Vegas yesterday for the Vegas race, and I was like, I don't know, man. Like, wouldn't it be cheaper for me to just go to Belgium? <laughs> yes. like, uh-huh. Sounds better. Um. So, what I, I I honestly didn't go just because I'm I'm I just could not imagine telling my wife with a four-year-old and I'm just going to Monaco for no reason, by the way, it's not mm-hmm. like, like I went to Miami for obviously new network and do all that stuff. But like, this is a crazy thing to say tape, but it's a little bit like a golf tournament where the worst place to follow F1 is at an F1 race. Right. Cause it's like, there's just so, there's such a bigger picture that you're just not seeing in the same way that if you're out at Augusta at hole 11, you're not really, unless you can use your phone, which you can't, you're not really seeing much of, of anything. I mean, you have no idea who's making a run on the back front nine or whatever. Um, and so with Monaco, it's Red Bull's dominance. And it's like, even though, so Tate, I don't know how much you know about F1, but basically. At Act Monaco, as if I know nothing. I think okay. that's the thing. Where, yeah. Tr- 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 Monaco like the is normal a weird American track. race fan. Yeah. Monaco is, you want to talk about Dale Earnhardt? Um, Dale yes. Earnhardt, by the way, once ran. So, you know, you can do the Monaco track. It's just the regular streets. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. apparently Dale Earnhardt in the nineties or whatever, just did it and like revved it up while it was used as a normal street. And that was just Dale just going through, you know, the, the, My the, coast, the coastline. Um, I've actually done it. And I'll say this, a lot of like Uber Eats delivery guys on bikes. And so if you're trying to rev up the Monaco during the Monaco track, you're, not going to go very far or mm. you're going to be charged with murder either one either one <laughs> um a lot of people just ordering you know takeout and and going through the the hairpin turns of, of the track um so monaco is a weird track there's not really any passing because the streets of monaco aren't that wide so qualifying is a huge deal and i think people it's it's always the kind of place where you can get a couple of freak things happen in qualifying and then everything kind of gets weird from there. It's not like, like in Miami, Max Verstappen was, I think, qualified ninth and then just passed all the cars over the course of the race. That really couldn't happen at Monaco unless there was some strategy blunder or there was rain or something weird like that. Um, And so it looked like Fernando Alonso was going to beat Max Verstappen in qualifying and thus have a huge advantage on Sunday. Verstappen had one of the best end of qualifying laps in the history of Monaco in the last two turns. He basically made up all the time he needed. It was incredible. And so I think what you're seeing now is you're seeing Red Bull come through in any situation, no matter how chaotic, no matter how much it seems like it's not going to happen. We keep getting the mailbag question on our show taped, like when is a car other than Red Bull going to win a race? And a lot of people thought the answer was Monaco. Well, it wasn't. Like, it's not. Max Verstappen can still do whatever he wants anywhere. And I've had a couple of people ask me the question, like why aren't why are people mad about this instead of treating it like Tiger Woods in 2000 um, or any of the dominant teams we've seen where everybody says this is actually good for the sport and I think part of it is I don't know if Americans have necessarily warmed up to Max Verstappen's personality they're named after an energy drink company which I think 
people don't love as far as an affinity. Like, all right, Mercedes won eight straight uh, constructor championships, but that was cool. If you wanted to wear a Mercedes hat around, that's awesome, you know, or, or you just mm-hmm. buy a Mercedes, right? Um, I had a, I, I had a uh, this guy in the league tell me one of his star players was a Ferrari fan. And I was like, Hey, why is he a Ferrari fan? He's like, Oh, cause he owns a Ferrari. And I was like, Oh, right. I get it. That's how that works. Um, so <laughs> it's like, you can have different affinities, but like, why would you be, if you're just picking teams, why would you be a Red Bull fan other than personalities, which I don't really think Max has right now. Um, and so that's just a, a hyper American thing, obviously in Europe and the Netherlands, he has a huge following. There's, you know, people who, who backed him when he had this battle against Lewis Hamilton a couple of years ago. I get that. But I just think from a week in, week out standpoint, Formula One probably needs a little bit more to to get in to sort of drive to survive era of fans, which, by the way, like I know there are people who always say to me, well, F1 shouldn't care about them. Well, they, F1 does. And so what's the next move? I don't think they're going to what they call a nerf. The, the car, which is basically pass a bunch of regulations to make the car less dominant. That's not going to happen this season. Most teams don't want that to happen because then you become a little too, comes a little too like David Sternish a little bit where you're just yeah, trying to, where we're trying to even the to, playing how, field. Yeah. Yeah. How to manufacture drama. Um, just get, get the F1 Tim Donahue out there. Um, and so I, I just don't know, by the way, they've kind of already had that, but I just don't know um, where F1 goes from here. And, and, and I think there's still compelling stuff, but we kind of know who's going to win and we kind of know who's going to win for the next few years until there's wholesale regulation changes. Is there any sort of like American issue where you have the Indy 500 and you have the Coca-Cola 400? I think that's what it's called happening on the same weekend. So you have NASCAR happening, you have Indy happening and you have the Grand Prix happening. Can we like figure out the scheduling where maybe it's next weekend and then we get all the eyeballs there? Is that possible or is this dumb? Wh- which one are you proposing moving? Cause I think they like, it's like the triple crown thing. They like the Memorial Day. We're all together. We're all watching racing. Okay, I got right. it. It just feels like you're feels like you're splitting up the audience. But maybe maybe it's different audiences at the end of the day, you know? Because I feel like a NASCAR fan might not be an Indy fan, or definitely probably is not a Formula One fan. So maybe maybe um, maybe it maybe it is a, just a triple header. That's what it is. It's a, it's a triple header, which I, I I quite like, and it's two. So if you don't know what the triple crown of um, racing is, it's Indy five hundred, Monaco, and then Le Mans. Um, which is obviously not this weekend, but still, uh, there's there's some there's some. It's cool to see it. I think there's some people who've said that they should break them up so that people could try to do all three um, right. in one single year. Like if you're like a Fernando Alonso type, but that I don't that doesn't have much momentum. Yeah, it has zero momentum. Well, uh, Kevin Clark, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for talking football with us. We got a lot more football to talk about as the off season is playing out. We got a lot of F one that we can always talk about uh, during this, you know, down summertime. It's always fun to do. You're the best. Slow news day is the show. Where else can we find all your work, Kevin Clark? Uh, the Ringer dot com. Probably write something. I kind of want to write about nil because oh, please off of our talk last week on One Shining Pod. Yeah, you can also well, find but- me on One Shining Pod. Yeah, there you go. You're like the new honorary co-host of One Shining Podcast. There you Dude, go. There's Kevin a lot of Clark. buzz about that app. A lot of buzz. I, I got a lot of nice compliments about our show. So uh, Yeah, we'll talk about NIL. We'll That's talk about uh, Miami, Jim Laranega, all that sort of stuff. He's Kevin Clark. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Now you get your sips in. Get your sips in now. I didn't take it. I was going to just say, <laughs> did you see uh, the Jim Laranega, Eric Spolster photo? Just two yeah, greats, I like it. Two, two of yeah. the goats. Yeah, the you already know. There you go. Uh, he is the, Kevin Clark. The best part is the coach L cropped everybody else out of the photo. If you see, it's just <laughs> like really badly cropped. He's just of like course. no, no new friends. It's just me yeah. and Spo. It's only us. It's only the legendary coaches in Miami. There you go, Kevin Clark. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks, Tate.